Welcome to the Doctor's Life Podcast with Diane Ansari Wynn, MD. Dr. Diane is a stress and burnout coach for doctors. With her 15 years of experience as an anesthesiologist and certification as a physician development coach, Dr. Diane coaches doctors on how to live a rich life of purpose, fulfillment, freedom, and happiness both at work and at home. In this podcast, Dr. Diane brings together doctors and researchers that are experts in health, wellness, stress, and burnout, as well as doctors that have been successful in clinical practice, academics, non-clinical careers, and business to share their expertise and life experience so that you can live your own life purpose, fulfillment, freedom, and happiness. To get free access to a PDF and video of easy and proven strategies that melt stress away and keep it away, simply register at www.dianeansari-win.com. That's www.dianeansari-win.com. Now here is your host, Dr. Diane Ansari Win. Hi, it's Dr. Diane here, and I have a quick request before we jump into the show. If you like this podcast, it would mean so much if you took just a moment to hop over to iTunes, write a review, and rate the show. That is how other people will find the show and get the same great value from it that I hope that you're getting. It just takes a few moments to click a star rating and write a quick note. Now, on to the show. Hi, everybody. It's Dr. Diane Ansari Wynn, and today on um, the Doctor's Life podcast, I am honored to have as my guest Dr. Terry Mason, who has been a diligent advocate for the patients and the citizens of Cook County since before 1983, but he started practice in 1983 as a urologist and uh, practiced urology for over 25 years. He's also had a long distinguished career as a chief medical officer and um, now the chief operating officer of the Cook County Department of Public Health, where he affects policy and helps to provide Uh, health services for over 2 million patients, 2.2 million patients. He has been a long-term advocate of healthy living for for patients and for doctors, of course. And um, to that end, he's also been a long-time host of the radio program, A Doctor in the House, where he's hosted that program for over 26 years on WVON. Radio, where he has a national following on iHeartRadio. Dr. Mason, we're going to discuss all the wonderful work that you do in our interview today. And um, again, it's such an honor to have you. Thank you so much for appearing on the podcast today. Could you describe how you got into medicine? I I like to ask all of our guests how they how they became a physician at such an uh, amazing story. Well, first of all, let me thank you for this opportunity to be on your podcast. I really appreciate it, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you and your listeners. My pleasure. To the question, to the question about how I got to be interested in medicine, I've always had a propensity to enjoy the sciences. I had a wonderful sixth grade teacher, Dr. Lewis Wright, who used to hold a class, a science class, an hour before school started. We were in grammar school. For us, as sixth graders, and I was just fascinated by uh, science. I didn't know that that meant that I wanted to be a physician. And it wasn't until I I was a part of the Nation of Islam under the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad at that uh, later on in my life. And he had the vision to build a, a hospital and met, um, being a member and being and wanted to really do what I felt was my part that God had for me to do. I said, I'm going to be a doctor for that institution. And that was the impetus through a sort of rocky time to get me put on the path to understanding what it meant to become a physician and then executing that plan. So you were very focused on fulfilling a specific role in the hospital at that time. Well, it was it was a medical center complex. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were it said to be built in Chicago. Uh, it started out trying to be built in one part of the city, and then they made that a park, so we couldn't build it there. And then the second location also became more of a park, and then we couldn't build it there. 
Mm-hmm. And though we had the money to, acqu- to do the acquisition of the property, it just every political barrier that you could imagine was was put in our way. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, it did not stop the desire to become a physician, and that that desire was really built on how do I best serve our community. Right. And that has been the, the interest, the emphasis. Yeah, that's what I had noticed from what you were saying is that it, you've always been fueled by the desire to serve the public throughout your career as a urologist. What did your practice look like, your urology practice? Well, one of the things that was really clear is I began to go through medical school and begin to look at what we called health disparities at that time. The, among the most disparate group were African American men, mm-hmm. and and th- there was a reason for that. And when we began to read the history of the medicine reports and other reports, much of it was because there was such discordance between what the medical professions looked like and what the patients looked like. And to be and- able to engender trust uh, from their medical professional, though to be homo racial, in other words, the same race as the patient was not a requirement, it certainly made it easier when not only were you of the same so-called race, but from the same sort of uh, community upbringing and background. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago in, in what's called the Inglewood neighborhood. I went to school all of my life in Chicago. I went to high school in Chicago, then I went to college at Loyola University, and then I went to medical school at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And then I did my residency in surgery at, at Mercy predominantly, and then my urology residency as the first African American ever trained formally at then Michael Reese Hospital. All of it was pretty much on the south side of the city. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I had a pretty good reputation and a pretty good representation within many of the civic groups and different groups that that we attended. And so, when I looked at where there was a disparity. One was in urology, and and I decided then that I would go ahead and and deal with the urologic issues that uh, that plague men and women, but mm-hmm. predominantly uh, men. So you practiced for 26 years in Chicago. Yes, yeah. During that 26 years, it was a, an amazing time in my life. Just an amazing time in my life, and to have a practice located on the south side of the city. Not that there weren't others, and there weren't other African-American urologists, because there were, but to have enjoyed the opportunity to become part of the lives of the men and women that we served and to establish a place where there was a urologist on one of the staffs of one of the major hospitals in the city that gave us access was was a great thing. And I'm grateful to the people like my mentor, Dr. Harvey J. Whitfield, who was the one who brought me in, let me use his office as I got started building a practice. Uh, Initially, that practice had to be built at uh, Mercy Hospital, and there were a number of barriers for my entry onto the staff at Michael Reese Hospital. But Mm -hmm. nonetheless, it all worked out. And I'm very grateful that I had 26 years to serve the community as a urologist. We're grateful for your service as well. So then did you start in the public health domain while you were still practicing urology, or did you make the transition from one to the next? Let me just say in all candor, I didn't know what, I didn't know what public health was. <laughs> I didn't even know the city had a public health department. But what – I've been doing during the 20, over 25 years that I spent practicing medicine, mm-hmm. I always made myself available to the community, speaking in every group that you can imagine, also doing the radio show at the same time. Right. And because what our, our community suffered from, and African American men even more, was just not understanding what was going on. And unfortunately, what I saw when I would come to some of the meetings is that doctors would come out and speak to people, but because doctors are so trained to go into presentation mode whenever they start talking to people, and mm-hmm. we're trained to go into pre- presentation mode because we're so accustomed to it all night, the hours of the night, 
any time of the day. Somebody says, well, tell us, present this patient. You go into your normal dialogue. This is a 26-year-old black female, <laughs> exactly. blah, 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 blah. And then you go, you know, and you mm-hmm. go into this whole thing about your, your, your history, your physical, the things you found, and then the discussion of your differential diagnosis. And unfortunately, what I saw was that there were very, I didn't find hardly any docs that could turn off from that. Whenever they got in, whenever they got in front of people, they automatically went into this presentation mode. And they would lose the people they were supposed to be talking to. Right. And since right. my parents were, my mother was a second grade person, she never had any education past that point in time. Um, and I'd made it a point that I had to be able to explain things in a way that people could really, really understand it. And it wasn't about how I sounded, and it wasn't about what language I used. The metric was did they understand what I was saying. That's all that mattered to me. And so whatever language I had to use, whatever examples out of their own life experience I had to pull in order for them to understand conceptually what I was talking about, that's what I did. And I did it on my radio show, and I did it in every presentation, and that's, in fact, how I ended up with a radio show. I didn't go out looking for one. It found me. Mm-hmm. And actually, I was a guest on the show a couple of times, and then the next time I went to do the show, the guest wasn't there, and the people said, well, it's all right. You can do it yourself. <laughs> the next thing I know, I've been there for the last 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it happened. Yeah, and I, I I can definitely attest you know, for the listeners out there that um, Dr. Mason puts his all into the show. I I was had the honor of being a guest on one of the programs uh, that we were discussing caregiver burnout, and um, Dr. Mason uh, was also on the show, and he shared his personal experiences. And he he just gives it all. He just gives it all. An inspirational example of service um, to the community and how to really connect with the community. I, I encourage everybody to to listen to the show, and um, at the at the very least, to get an example of how how you could communicate with your patients and with your community. So, um, Dr. Mason, I know that you have a passion, a particular passion around healthy eating and food, and um, I don't, I don't want another minute to go by without you being able to speak about that. Let me just say that that started uh, in my practice. Mm-hmm. It started mm-hmm. as I was doing a lot with African American men around erectile dysfunction. And as we begin to learn more and more about erectile dysfunction, we began to learn that the real cause of erectile dysfunction was around endothelial cell dysfunction. Mm-hmm. So the endothelium was damaged, and it was damaged by the same process that when prolonged would end up with what we call so-called atherosclerosis, and, and that manif- would manifest itself in what we call coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, stroke, and so forth. Right. So what what we began to find and understand was there were some common links to those things which caused this endothelial cell dysfunction. Mm-hmm. And when we did that, it altered the ability of the cell to manufacture nitric oxide. And when that happened, that was one of the major keys in being able to initiate and or maintain an erection. And so as that science became uh, clear in the medical literature and starting in the mid-80s and going forward, it was clear that the things that were causing that were also causing or implicated in things like diabetes, hypertension, and other diseases. Right. So when we looked at, so one of the things that I always say to people when I'm giving a lecture, is we want to talk about so-called, and I'll tell you why I say so-called in a moment, mm-hmm. cardiovascular disease. Well, if you ask yourself, well, if you if you did a root cause analysis on cardiovascular disease, that is, if you did your five whys or whatever the process you wanted to use, 
you mm-hmm. find out that there's absolutely nothing wrong with the heart muscle early on, okay? Mm-hmm. And then if you ask, well, what caused the problem to become with the heart muscle? Well, because the blood vessel got blocked. Well, the blood vessel got blocked. How did the blood get the vessel, vessel get blocked? Well, because there was this, this buildup of plaque in the artery. Well, then mm-hmm. how did that happen? How did the plaque get built up in the artery? And when you carry that to its logical conclusion, you come back to one thing, food. It's what we ate that got digested, that went in the bloodstream, that created this irritation of the endothelial cell lining and this whole cascade with bone cells and everything else, and a rupture of clot and or uh, calcification of the plaque, are the root cause of which is all food. And so when you, and if you think about that, from a public health perspective, which is why I ended up going and doing what I did, and I left the practice of urology because I no longer wanted to just deal with the effects or the complication of disease. I wanted to see if I can get in front of it and mm-hmm. either prevent and or reverse this disease. And Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn has written a great book on how to prevent and reverse heart disease. He's had multiple papers on this subject, complete with angiograms and cardiac PET CT scans that show how food can positively modulate this problem. In other words, how we could actually eradicate this problem. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what, that's what I want to do from now on. In fact, I'm doing a talk at the AUA on diet and prostate cancer. Because what happened, what's clear to me, and that's why I do what I do, what's clear to me that no matter how many prostates I took out, I hadn't done one thing for that person to really help them prevent their recurrence because I I learned that I really wasn't curing anybody because if I had cured them, why did they ever need to come back and see me? Why did I need to follow them if they were cured? They weren't cured. And what what did I find out in medicine? I was just controlling disease or trying Mm -hmm. to control disease. Our medications control disease. We don't cure anything. Our medicine controls the diabetes. It doesn't cure the diabetes. Our medicine... They're all just things that help us control. And I didn't want to spend the remainder of my life doing that. So mm-hmm. I stopped. That's just exactly what happened. Because I had promised to God that I was going to really, I wanted to this to help, not control, but to see what I could really do to help. And I'll tell you, the more and more I learned by going to people like Dean Ornish and going to people like Carl Elson and reading, and then I was in the movie Forks Over Knives, and I got to meet T. Colin Campbell and just any number of these physicians would all come, some biochemically through research, to the same conclusion. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, is it an uphill battle? There's no question because there's no value proposition in our current medical model for health. Right. There's no value. What drives our current system, what current drives our current system is the management of disease. Mm-hmm. And without disease, our system would collapse. Right. So, so this is why I do what I do. And I got into public health, not because I was looking to public health. I was actually called by the mayor's office in the city of Chicago to come down and interview for the commissioner of health job while I was still in practice. And I, I didn't even, like I said, I didn't know there was a public health job. <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. Right. Didn't right. know. I mean, I thought, like, you need an internist with an infectious disease background. You don't need a urologist. Besides, I have no NPH, none of that stuff. But what I didn't know is that he was looking for someone who could put public in public health. Yeah. And he was yeah. looking for some. And I, through my radio show, all the talks you talked about, I've been in so many basements and lecture halls, and I can't tell you how many talks at the community level I did. And they were the ones who made the recommendation to the mayor. I never knew uh, that. There you go. Yeah. And so I said, well, I told myself, well, you can't afford to pay me to be the public health commissioner because you, I'd have to take a 50% pay cut to do that or more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I tell you, when I thought about it for a while and I talked over it over with my pastor, I talked it over with other friends of mine, and to make a very long story short, I took the job, I sold my house, I sold my cars, I sold all of that stuff. Because what it taught me was it gave me an exercise to determine whether or not I own my things or did my things own me. Uh And if I own them, then I could do with them what I want. So that's what I did. And I I tell you, 
That first, that year is the Commission of Health of the City of Chicago, which mm-hmm. now the, you know, it was about over a million people for that too. But it was really an amazing experience, one of the best experiences I had in my life. And now I really want to spend the rest of it working on policy systems and environmental changes to really help improve the health of the public of the United States and the world. Yeah, that that is, um, is a life's work because, as you said, the the system is designed differently. But yeah. um, but through your efforts, things are changing. I'm so curious. You mentioned um, changing our diet, the food that we take in, and I, I wouldn't be able to leave this conversation without having you comment on that so that we can all learn uh, what your recommendations would be and what you've been finding in terms of um, the, the studies that you've um, been doing and um, and what you've been teaching the community about food and about health. Sure. In a nutshell, and let me just say this before I go forward, there are times when we do need what we offer in the medical system. I mean, there's mm-hmm. nothing... Someone has an emergency, chest pain, and and that sort of thing, and and you need a stent. You need a stent. That's right. And until you get your, and you also need to make sure that your blood pressure is controlled, and you need to make sure that those things need to be monitored and made sure that they're doing well because you can't go out, go by how you feel. So I want to make sure that that's out there. Good the point. next thing I would say, yeah, I mean, because I I want people to understand that I'm not anti doctor Absolutely not. I think that you need to go see your doctor and that you need to understand what your numbers are. But the one thing you can do more than anything else to improve your overall health is to adopt an entirely plant-based, whole food plant-based diet. Now, what do I mean by that? It's real simple. It means exactly what it says. Am I saying become a vegetarian? Am I saying become a vegan? No. I'm saying that you need to eat as much as you can. You need to drink water and you need to eat whole foods. In other words, you need to get not something processed, but eat the green, eat the spinach, eat the the beans, eat the legumes, eat the the fruits, the vegetables. And you don't need to get these things. You don't have to be fancy with this. There's plenty. If you've never cooked this stuff cooked before, um, because unfortunately in America we eat way too many of our food, too much of our food cooked in somebody else's kitchen. And we've even turned our cars into dining uh, dining areas <laughs> where we're eating in, in our cars now, and that was never we should have never intended that to be, and we our lives are so busy that we 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 miss the joy out of the shopping for and preparing food, and not just preparing it alone, but even with friends and family. Mm-hmm. So it's simple: drink water, eat food, eat whole food, plant based. That is, eat the foods as close to the way they come out of the ground as possible. Mm-hmm. And and you can cook them, you can do what you need to do, but and use as little to no oil as possible. Avoid processed sugars. And we've got processed sugars in almost everything that we that comes out of a box, bottle or can these days. Mm-hmm. So how do I suggest that you get started? People say, Well that's that's radical. I say, Well, you know, I used to be on in the general surgery and part of general I did C V surgery. And people would come in with blocked arteries, and we'd have to take a knife and cut down to their sternum and take a saw and cut their sternum in half then put a big retractor to hold it apart and make a big long incision on their leg and take out their pain. You know, that's kind of radical. Yeah, you probably know my background's anesthesia, and I think it's kind of medieval, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you think about it. And, and now we have people thinking that they can grow to be – three, four, five, six, seven hundred pounds, and their answer is gastric bypass surgery. I mean, we're we're giving people the wrong messages, you know, rather than to really deal with, look, and I know that it's difficult because we're in competition with all of the advertising and all the the ways that we make bad food widely accessible and cheap. So one of the things that we're working on legislatively is why should we have to pay more for organic, true organically grown foods? We should subsidize them and make them cheap and widely available. Available, And we mm-hmm. should begin to do this, start with our children, changing from the garbage that many of them eat 
in these school programs to wholesome foods. And for those schools that are doing wholesome foods, I congratulate you and, and want you to continue to continue to do it. We need to, we need to do it, and it's simple. Now, do you need to be in the gym five hours a day? Absolutely not. If you look at what, is the, what are the keys to weight loss, food is 80% of it, 80%. 20% is exercise. The idea that you're going to go to a gym and exercise your weight away on a long-term basis is, is fallacious. You, if you don't change the way you eat, it doesn't matter how much you exercise. You will not ever control the weight the way you want to. And weight to me, one of the endpoints and one of the metrics, but you really, really want to look at your percent body fat. That's what you want to look, you want to look at because you want to be lean. It doesn't matter how big you are, just lean, and you don't have to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger or Lee Haney or somebody like that to think that you're right. to think that you're healthy. You're healthy. That's really not healthy. It's simple: whole food, plant based, and drink water. Now, is that pretty simple? It sounds very simple. <laughs> anyway. It is simple. Yeah. And if you want cookbooks, you can get you can get cookbooks. There's all kinds. Uh, Dr. Esselstyn uh, has there's two of them. If you go watch the movie Forks Over Knives. I'm going to watch it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you watch Forks Over Knives. There's a companion cookbook that goes with it. There are all kinds of whole food plant-based recipes. Is it different? Yes, it's different. I'm going to tell you, yes, it's different. And you say, well, I can't do that right away. Then I say, well, if you can't do it right away, start off just adding more fresh fruits and vegetables to whatever it is you're eating. And just keep adding and keep adding and keep adding. Because I'm telling you. A statin will, I mean, a statin, any of these drugs will never cure anything. But this food will actually reverse. It will actually reverse. I just did, uh, we were just up in racing with Dr. Esselstyn. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I am absolutely convinced of the data. He has published data. I think it's in the American Journal of Family Practice. Looking at his data on his over 200 patients, not only did these patients have their their so-called cardiovascular disease reversed, but many of these people, and, and he proved it with angiograms and PET CTs of their hearts to show mm -hmm. you the change in revascularization pattern. So their disease was actually reversed. And for those that remained, and most of them did remain on this way of eating, they never had recurrence. Wow. There's not a pill out there that I can say that does that. No. There's not an operation I can say that does that. There's not mm -hmm. a stent that you can put in that you'll say you'll never have a recurrence of the disease. So to all my colleagues out there, my book is going to be coming out hopefully soon that is going to talk about why I think we're treating the wrong disease. Mm -hmm. the, what's the um, when do you expect the book to be released, Dr. Mason? Well, uh, well I'm working on, with, working on the publisher, so I have, we'll have to do a part two interview, and I'll let you know exactly. Okay, yeah, we'll do a part two interview, and I can up, I can update people um, that follow the podcast when the book is released. So just keep an eye out for that, everybody. And, turn on, turn and I would say for the, doc, for the doctors right now, if they want to find out about supplements, they want to find out about what you can do for cancer, what you can do for all these different things, you mm -hmm. can go. Mike Greger, Dr. Michael Greger has done a magnificent job in combing the peer-reviewed literature and creating these very simple videos that are complete with all of the academic citations for everything that he does. And it's called nutritionfactswithans.org. And it is a great source in case, so that you don't have time to go do all this research. And that's what Mike always says. But he's done a great job in, in putting together these videos so that if you want to go look up, you know, breast cancer, diet and breast cancer, or whatever you want, yeah. you, can, you can look it up and they'll give you all of the latest peer reviewed science. It's in a, in a video, but if you click on sources cited, then out will come all of the links, hyperlinks, to each of these articles, and it's all free. I love it. I love it. Thanks. I'm going to check that out, and I encourage everybody to go check that out. And Mike Greger is a physician who has a great story about his grandmother and why he's doing what he's doing right now to get this information out to everybody all over the world. And he has done, he and his team 
have done an absolute magnificent job. Um, he, the videos are all for free. Everything on this website is for free. So I would in, implore all of your listeners to go and, and check it out. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, Dr. Mason, it has really been a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. You are an inspirational human being as well as an a amazing doctor. You really have shown us through your example what it means to be a true public servant, someone that's been in service to the community, um, a holistic type of practice of medicine. And you've done it all. You've been um, a surgeon, a counselor um, to the community. Now you're not only just in, involved in educating the community, but also involved in making policy to improve the health of um, over 2 million people in the um, in Cook County currently. And um, I just can't say enough. I, I am so honored to have you on the show today. And I'm so grateful for, for you to just have spoken about what you're doing. And um, I know that you all have learned something. And I hope that you all take what you have learned and incorporate that into your practice and into your daily lives. So thank you again, Dr. Mason. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. I always appreciate the opportunity to share. I think it's so important. I think our doctors, because, you know, it's not our fault. We weren't trained to do this. You know, right. we, weren't, we weren't trained. I had 40 minutes of nutrition when I was when I was in medical school at the University of Illinois, 40 years, I mean, 40 minutes and four mm-hmm. years of, of education. And four years and of so education. So yeah. yeah. it, it, um, and, and it's because that wasn't what we were, were there to learn. That wasn't what we were, were there to understand. And so I don't, it's not our fault. And not only that, but unfortunately the current system doesn't even allow us enough time to spend time with people, even when we want to to do the kind of counseling in for the, this kind of work, even if we could. And we don't get the right kind of reimbursement to make that something that people even want to do. So in the 15 minutes now that a lot of our primary care docs get to see a patient, you've got so much, you know, you got so much on your plate. You know, you so much on your plate. So I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. You know, I think that, and I had to get this, I had to go get this outside of the scope of medicine. So there's a course at Cornell, eCornell, that you can take that Dr. T. Colin Campbell put together. There's other things that you're going to have to do if you're interested in doing this. And I would implore you, before even recommending it to your patients, try it yourself. Mm -hmm. Try it yourself. Don't take my word for it. Try it yourself. I did. And I went from, and I lost close to 40 pounds. Wow. Just from changing diet. Just from changing diet. Now, do I exercise? Yeah, I exercise. I think it's important. But most of that is, is diet. It's, most of it is just changing the way we eat. So I implore you to at least look at it. Look at some of the things on Michael Greger's website. Really familiarize yourself with it. Watch Forks Over Knives if you haven't done it. Um, and, and begin to make these resources available first to yourselves and to the people that you serve. Excellent. This is very, very well said. Thank you, Dr. Mason. Well, and thank you all for attending the uh, podcast today. We hope that you, I know that you learned something um, important that you can take into your own lives, into your patients' lives. And with that, we'll say goodbye for now. And um, I hope everybody stays happy and healthy. Take care, everybody. You've been listening to the Doctor's Life Podcast with Diane Ansari Wynn, MD. Go to wwwdianansari wincom to read show notes, listen to past episodes, share your comments and show ideas, and pick up your free PDF and video of easy and proven strategies that will melt your daily stress away. That's wwwdianneansari wincom